Hello everyone, and welcome to the Area of a Circle Post Lab. So hopefully you've got your lab sheet out in front of you here so that you can compare your answers and perhaps even take a few notes about what we discuss in this Post Lab. This is where we're going to kind of go over everything and make sure that we uh, all come to a consensus on a relationship and a math model. So in this lab, we were looking at the relationship between the area of a circle and its radius. And so we started out by, um, by measuring the area, counting the blocks and estimating, a lot of estimating in this lab, and measuring the radius of six different circles. When you graphed those circles, you got a graph that looked something like this. And it wasn't a linear graph. Note here my use of capital A for area and R for radius. Area is in centimeters squared, radius is in centimeters. So if you might remember, we decided to call this a top opening parabola. Yeah, it's only half of it. The other half is over here in the second quadrant, but that's negative radii, and I don't even know what that means. Right? So we're only using the part that is physically important to us. Right? But this is still a top opening parabola. So, you had to linearize this parabola. That means do something to the radius, which turns this into a straight line graph. So, what did you have to do? That's right. You graphed area and radius squared, and that gave you a linear graph. Again, showing the top opening parabolas show a independent variable squared kind of relationship. And hopefully, you're seeing that pattern. So, when you see it again, you'll know right what to do. So, once you did that, you hopefully got a nice linear graph that basically went through 0, 0, and we'll talk a little bit about the y-intercept. Now, this probably wasn't as good as the example that I did in my previous video, but that's because this is real data, right? And you had to make a lot of estimations. So you might have had some points a little bit below and points a little bit above the line, but that's why we do a linear regression, or as we call it in the program, a linear fit, because that kind of averages out statistically all of your data. But we did end up with a pretty linear graph, right, and pretty linear data that went through 0, 0. So what does that tell us about the variables? Well, as we've seen repeatedly, when you graph two variables and they result in a graph that is linear and contains 0, 0, that means those two variables are proportional to one another. Not area and radius, that didn't give us a linear graph that went through 0, 0, but rather area and radius squared. So the area here is proportional to the radius squared. Let's take a look at your data. And this doesn't work out perfectly like in the previous video because it's real, right? But if you double the radius of a circle, you don't get twice the area. You get four times the area. If you triple the radius, you don't get three times the area, you get nine times the area, three squared, right? Quadruple the radius, you'll get four squared, 16 times the area. That's what it means to have area proportional to radius squared. You cut the radius in half, you get one half squared, only one quarter of the area. Fun with fractions, right? And these kinds of proportional relationships are important to us to understand what's going on in nature. And you might even see questions on a test, say, nudge, nudge, or a uh, concept builder, right, that asks us to compare variables proportionally. But this doesn't allow us to make direct predition, prediction sorry, of what's going to go on. At this radius, we'll get this area, or this area requires this radius. For that, we need to build a math model. And thankfully, we have a beautiful linear graph of which to build that linear math model, of course, our old friend y equals mx plus b, where we're not going to use y, m, x, or b, but plug in things that are more meaningful to us in this lab. For example, our y variable is what we graphed on the vertical axis, which in both cases is the area. So we might use a symbol of capital A. Hopefully by now you've stopped using x and y all the time. This isn't math class, right? It would get awful confusing if every graph we uh, discover in this class were x and y, right? So we use things that are more meaningful. M here is the slopes. Well, I want to take a look at the slopes. Now, as you're going to see here, uh, I may not have your slopes in here. You know, I had to make this 
this uh, video in the past, but I do have a set of data from a few years ago that we're going to look at. And here is the data. Right? These are the slopes of the linearized graphs that people put in. We have here about uh, 38 data points throughout, I believe, that year was uh, five years, or five hours, sorry, of uh, honors physics. And so here's all the data. And if we take a look at those slopes, you'll notice they're all pretty close to one another, right? Which tells us that this is an, a number that's popping up here in nature, right? Almost all of our first digits are threes. There's a few outliers, there's a few twos, definitely no fours. Right? but almost all threes. And our second digits, while they're getting a little more wild, still are fairly close. Here we have a, a 2.8, right? And I think down here somewhere we've got a 3.2, but they're all pretty close, right, to the same thing. Well, if we take an average, it works out to be about 3.1 to two sig figs. 3.07 to three, but I think two sig figs is probably all we're gonna wanna keep here. And I mean, think about what we used to measure, right? We used um, uh, the paper that had squares that were one centimeter on a side. So that means we had uh, marked calibrations to the nearest centimeter, which means we can estimate to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. And so notice here, we're going to keep in our average to the nearest tenth. Kind of matches the whole idea here of sig figs. And I certainly could have had you maybe round off to that, and maybe it would have been best if you had done that. But, you know, we can take this data and then round off here. It's always good not to round too much. So I'll round off now and use that. But just remember that even to three sig figs, we had 3.07, which sounds suspiciously familiar, I hope. But we will get there. So I'm going to throw in a 3.1. Units? Well, how do you find a slope? Rise over run. So this is how we will find the uh, units of the slope. So the units of rise are centimeters squared. The units of run are also centimeters squared. What does that diagonal line mean? It means divide. And what happens when you divide something by itself? It doesn't go away, it becomes a one. And multiplying by one doesn't change anything because one is the multiplicative identity. So this is going to be one of those weird numbers where we traditionally write it without units. Doesn't mean they're not there. Okay, they're there, as you can see. It just means that they happen to cancel out in this case, okay, because we're using the same thing. What that tells us is that if I had given you paper that was one inch on a side, we'd still get the same thing. We'd get like 3.1 inch squared per inch squared, right? So it's not really the units that are important, it's the number in this case. So those will drop away. What's the x variable? Okay. Well, the x variable is what we graphed on the horizontal axis. Not radius, right? Not radius, but radius squared is the linear version here, right? The linearized graph. So we have to put in r squared. This is very important, otherwise we don't get the right uh, the right uh, equation out, the right math model out of this, right? So it's radius squared that we graphed on the horizontal axis in our linearized graph. But what about our y-intercept? Now, unlike the, uh, the previous movie where I used perfect magical data, right, the y-intercept that you got was probably not zero. Now, it's probably pretty small, but is it small enough that we should just call it zero, zero? Well, let's think about what a zero, zero point here would mean. A zero, zero point on this graph would mean what? Not that's where it hits the axis, that's what it means in math class, but that when the radius is zero, the area is also zero. Does that make logical sense? I hope so. And if you shrink this circle down to a dot, there's no area either. Right? And not to mention, if you check with the 5% rule, take 5% of your largest area and compare it, I bet your y-intercept you got from graphical analysis is way smaller right, than 5% of your largest area. Right? So it is so small that we can neglect it. We can say, you know what? Both logically and statistically, 
it should be zero, zero. In fact, I even suggested you put that uh, data point into your graph as a logical point to help us see everything. So you don't have to add zeros. So there is our general math model. Well, kind of like our last circle lab, this slope's kind of important. Anybody see it? What should that slope actually be? What's the theoretical value of our slope? Ah, uh, yes, indeed, it is. <laughs> pi. Once again, we have discovered pi as a number that exists in nature, and it again has to do with circles. Pi is so important that we've given it its very own name and its very own Greek symbol. Not all slopes work out that way, but this one does. It's so important it's given its own name and its own symbol. And if we plug that in, instead of using our number, we get a general math model that the area of a circle is pi r squared, pi times the radius squared. Now this is probably an equation that you're like, yeah, my math teacher once told me that equation. But now you know that this equation actually exists in nature. And this process of linearization allows us to find this math model, which not only is the math model of this graph, it's the math model of that graph, right? Because if you graph something with an r squared, it's going to be a parabola. That's the power of linearization. It allows us to see and check what is the relationship between the variables, and then from that, build a math model that actually is the math model of both graphs, depending on whether you're graphing versus the radius, you get the parabola, or versus the radius squared, which is the straight line. We could also do this by curve fitting, but personally, I like linearization, because I think it points out the relationship better. You gotta make that choice to linearize. With this general math model now, we can go off and, you know, figure out any circle that we need to. Any radius we have, we can decide what the area will be. Any area that we want, we can decide what radius we need. Just a couple steps of algebra. That's the power of building a math model. And once again, we've also discovered pi. And notice, to two sig figs, right, we had zero error. Even though we had to make lots of estimations, this is the power of estimating. This is the power of averaging when we take all of that data right, together and we average it out, right? Even though some people maybe didn't estimate as well as some others, right? maybe yours was a little further off. Maybe you had a three or a 3.2, right? And remember, even if we go out to three sig figs, which is a little beyond what we should given our measuring device, right? Um, we still only had a 3.07 which compared to 3.14 is pretty dang close, right? So it should give you a lot of belief, if you will, that pi is not just some number that your math teacher made up, it's a number that exists in nature right? and relates to circles. So I hope you enjoyed this little area of a circle post-lab.